Thank you for standing by. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. After the presentation, we will conduct a question and answer session. If you would like to ask a question, you may press star 1. Today's conference is being recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. Your host of today's call is Ms. Irene Ahir. Thank you. You may begin. Hello, and welcome to today's FDA webinar. I am Irene Ahir of CDRH's Office of Communication and Education. Today, we will be discussing the final guidance document titled, Contents of Pre-Market Submissions for Management of Cybersecurity and Medical Devices, which published on October 2nd. The guidance applies to pre-market medical device submissions received beginning October 1st, 2014. This guidance identifies issues related to cybersecurity that manufacturers should consider in the design and development of their medical devices and in preparing pre-market submissions. The need for effective cybersecurity to assure medical device functionality and safety has become more important with the increasing use of wireless, internet and network connected devices and the frequent electronic exchange of medical device related health information. Today, Dr. Abby Desta from CDRH's Office of device evaluation will present an overview of the guidance document. After the presentation, we will host a Q&A session during which Abby will be joined by the CDRH subject matter experts. Now, I give you Abby. Uh, good afternoon and thank you for taking part in today's webinar on FDA's recently published guidance on content of pre-market submission for management of cybersecurity and medical devices. The purpose of this webinar is to discuss the agency's recommendation on how companies should document their approach to managing cybersecurity risks on vulnerable medical devices and their pre-market submission. I will attempt to clarify FDA's recommendation and answer questions related to this guidance. As background, this guidance document contains the FDA's current thinking on managing cybersecurity risk. It should be viewed only as recommendations by the agency. Companies may choose to implement alternative approach to mitigating cybersecurity risk and their medical devices. Medical devices, like other computer systems, can be vulnerable the security breaches potentially impacting the safety and effectiveness of the device. This vulnerability is dramatically increased as more and more medical devices become connected to the Internet, hospital networks, and other medical devices. To the extent to which security controls are needed will depend on device intended use, the intended environment of use, the type of cybersecurity present, and the likelihood the vulnerability will be exploited and the probability that their exploit will cause risk to patients. FDA recognizes that medical device security is a shared responsibility between stakeholders, including healthcare facility, patients, providers, and manufacturers of medical devices. The agency recommends the instructions of use and the product specifications of, of a medical device include information on how cybersecurity controls excuse me, on what cybersecurity controls are expected and the intended environment use. This guidance is applicable to pre-market submissions for medical devices. Sorry, I think I'm one slide ahead. I apologize. This guidance is applicable to pre-market submissions for medical devices containing software, program logic, or standalone software that's a medical device. Types of submissions that this guidance applies to are pre-market notifications, de novo submissions, pre-market approvals, product development protocols, and humanitarian device exemptions. The agency the agencies, the agency recommends that medical device manufacturer provide justifications 
and their pre-market submission for the security functions chosen for the medical device. Examples of security functions manufacturers may choose to consider include limiting access to device through authentication of users, terminating sessions after a set period of time where it's appropriate for that use environment, using layered authentication model, using appropriate authentications, strengthening password protection, taking steps to minimize tampering, and requiring authentic authentication before permitting updates. Implementing features that allow for security compromises to be detected, recognized, logged, timed, and acted upon during normal use, developing and providing information to end users concerning appropriate actions to take upon detection of cybersecurity events, implementing device features that protect pro critical functionalities even when device cybersecurity has been compromised, and providing methods for retention and recovery of device configuration information. The documentation that the agency would like to see in a pre-market sub submission includes hazard analysis, mitigation and design consideration, considerations pertaining to intentional and unintentional cybersecurity risks associated with your device, a traceability matrix that links your actual cybersecurity controls to the cybersecurity risks that were considered, a summary describing the plan for providing validated software updates and patches as needed, a summary describing controls that are in place to assure that the medical device software will, be main, will maintain its integrity while it's under your control, device instruction for use and product specifications related to recommended cybersecurity controls appropriate for the intended use environment. The agency has and will continue to recognize appropriate consensus standards on this topic. On page 7 of the guidance document is the list of recognized standards. A link is also available where you can periodically check for updates on the recognized standards. I would like to emphasize again, manufacturers may choose to implement alternative approach for cybersecurity controls. If you do so, the agency asks that you provide the rationale for the appropriateness of the approach that you have chosen. As you all know, cybersecurity threats are continuously evolving. The FDA would like to stress the importance of having a plan in place to appropriately manage this evolving threat, threat landscape. Thank you, and I'll now, I'm now ready to answer your questions. If you'd like to ask a question, please press star 1 on the phone at this time. Again, to ask a question, please press star 1 and record your name when prompted. One moment, please, for your first question. All right, one moment, please. Our first question is from Boston Scientific. Your line is open. Well, hi there. Uh, regarding the mitigation of cybersecurity risks, is it adequate that the mitigations chosen um, to reduce the, the risks were selected in order to arrive at an acceptable residual risk for the system? Or does each risk have to be mitigated individually? Could you restate the question? I'm not sure I fully understood it. So, so you do a, a, a risk analysis of, of the cybersecurity risks, and the question is, is it adequate that your mitigations for all risks is that you've reduced the risk to an acceptable level for the whole system, or do you have to actually provide a justification for the mitigation of each and every single risk.
And generally speaking, uh, I believe we look at the system as a whole, not individual risk. So we, we would like to see that the risk to your medical device as a whole has been reduced. To an acceptable residual risk. Okay. That's correct. Very good. Uh, again, with regards to cybersecurity. Right. Okay. Um, and what about password protect protection? When you include pa password protection, you kind of you provide security, but you also reduce availability of the device. What is the thinking on that? I, again, that's recommended based on the appropriateness for the use of your device. Uh, the agency recognizes that in some applications that might be an appropriate approach. For others, it might not. Okay. It's one of the things we'd like you to consider in your design. Okay. And we do. Thank you. Thank you. And I'd just like to remind participants, if you'd like to ask a question, please press star 1 on your phone. And when prompted, please record your, your, your name. Our next question is from Prabhu. Your line is open. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> wanted to get some clarification on the applicability of the guidance uh, in terms of the submitted products. Is it is it intended to apply for uh, newly submitted products, uh, or what part or aspects of it apply to older products um, that are fielded? This uh, this uh, this guidance is for submissions that are coming in. If it's a modification to an existing product, it might or might not be appropriate to have included this depending on kind of in what generation it might be. I, I would advise you to talk to the branch and division where your device is being reviewed to see uh, what their expectations might be. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Our next question is from John Aoki. Your line is open. Yeah, my question deals with uh, patient data. Is is cybersecurity primarily important because of patient data, or is it um, so that people can't hack into your system and ruin your system? I mean, is the main goal patient data? The main goal is device integrity and the function of the device. If patient data is part of that device integrity, then the data is important. But And just as important is whether that device is providing diagnostic or therapeutic functions. So I'm not sure how to separate out one functionality after another. We would like the device to be as secure as possible, regardless of what aspects are in there. So if it's a standalone unit and it's not hooked up to the Internet, um, but there is perhaps a USB port in, in your system, so you can do updates, phys physical updates to your system. Um, yeah, I mean, that's a potential vulnerability where both the device, the patient data or the functionality of the device can be compromised. So as part of your design of your device, that's a risk you should consider and mitigate for. Okay. So if someone inserts just any type of USB drive, maybe you can prohibit it or something like that. It has to have a certain, you know, passcode on the USB drive. Again, I, I, the idea of this guidance is not to be prescriptive as to the method. It's just sure. one of the areas of risk well, that we would like to consider. Example. Okay. All right, thank you. Thank you. Our next question is from Mike Amadi. Your line is open. Uh, yes, I have a two-part question. Uh, one is, uh, the, this is guidance, um, and uh, if somebody submits something and uh, you determine whether that the not really follow the uh, the essence or the spirit of the guidance, um, uh, exactly what does the intent, the FDA uh, intend to do in that case? The other is, uh, how is the FDA actually going to make a determination that what's been submitted is actually adequate under the guidance? I, again, the, this guidance is a recommendation. Uh, 
if we get a submission that we feel may may not adequately address cybersecurity, we may have that discussion with the with the sponsor about how those risks may or may not require mitigation. Depending on the risks associated with the device, I think each branch will make a decision as to the, the safety of the device. All right, thank you. Our next question is from Lori Trotter. Your line is open. Yes, could you clarify for if there is a mobile app that's intended to control a device, does that fall within the scope of this guidance document? A mobile app that's in, a mobile app that's intended to control a device is an accessory to a device, so it will be a medical device. So there there would be there would need to be some considerations as to what risks might be present to that app. Okay, thank you. Next question is from Mike Tuscan. Your line is open. Uh, hello. Uh, in the security world, cybersecurity world, I'm, I'm thinking that there's two kinds of risks. Uh, those that have uh, could impact the safety and effectiveness of the device, and there's other risks that uh, could impact uh, the the uh, financial or, or picture of the company, a uh, loss in sales, uh, penalties, fines, etc. When I read the guidance. I am assuming that it is all focused on maintaining the device as safe and effective. Is, is that correct? Uh, that is correct. That is within our, maintaining the safety and effectiveness, effectiveness of the device is within our regulatory authority, so that's what it's focused on. Okay, and those other cybersecurity risks that could result in penalties would not be included in this guidance. Again, this guidance is focused on the regulatory authority of the FDA, which is safety and effectiveness of medical devices. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Our next question is from Paul Dallarova. Your line is open. I assume that's me. Uh, it's Paul Arada. I'm with Covidian. Uh, you mentioned collaboration between um, the uh, customer and the medical device manufacturer, and this becomes fairly a, a fairly complex uh, proposition. And I'm thinking in particular about the requirement for um, an authenticated user and how many devices today have service passwords that are widely available um, uh, on the internet. And it seems to me that this tends to drive uh, those devices that use such passwords to be network connected in order to provide that kind of uh, flexibility in, in user authentication. Um, because, you know, if the facility wishes to change the, the authentication uh, for a particular device, and now the now the uh, main uh, the manufacturer can can no longer access it because the, the facility has changed it. How how do you envision that getting um, reconciled? I mean, I, I recognize that there are difficulties in terms of providing easy access for maintenance and other functionalities and providing security. I'm not sure the agency would be prescriptive. The agency would like to have manufacturers consider that the potential risk versus the benefit and be able to think about adequate methods of mitigating the risk while still providing the functionality and the, ease, the access that might be needed to patch and maintain a medical device. Um, I, I recognize my answer is not really an answer, but it's also and that's have not to be prescriptive, but allow you to think creatively and come up with an answer. We'll take the next question. Fuck. 
Okay, Les, I'm so sorry. You can repeat your question now. Oh, great. <laughs> this is Les Gray at uh, Abbott Laboratories. Um, there's, uh, between the draft guidance you guys sent out earlier in the year and the final, I know there's two differences. Uh, one was the uh, you had called out in the draft a comp uh, buckets, confidentiality, integrity, and availability, uh, as if you kind of wanted us to bucket our risk into those buckets. Uh, and then in the final, you did not really call that out. Are you expecting to see uh, us do our risk analysis based on those types of buckets? or? Uh, the draft guidance was there not to be implemented, but to get comments. The final guidance is what we would like to see being implemented. Uh, there were changes, as you stated, between the draft and final guidance. Part of that was in response to the comments we received, and part of that was to make to make sure that we were being we were properly balancing uh, the, our recommendations and the actual burden that might be presented to industry. Okay. So on the second, the second one, which is not really related, it's just something new in, the, in, in this versus the draft, was you actually say that the FDA does not need to review or approve software changes solely for cybersecurity, as long as we describe that in our cybersecurity update patching plans. Um, can you expand on what that, that means? Does that mean we don't have to address cybersecurity when we do an update? What we're trying to say there is if you're doing an update that would not require a new submission, updates would be considered maintenance, and routine updates uh, of um, uh, routine updates where you're providing patches related to cybersecurity would not be something that would require additional pre-market submissions. Okay, so just just so I'm, I'm I'm clear, if I do an update based on cybersecurity only, it doesn't require an update to the submission. But anything outside of cybersecurity, then that falls under uh, other submission requirements. Again, this does not address other types of updates in terms of if you're providing a patch to your software system because of cybersecurity, it would be an area where FDA would not require uh, additional information. Uh, I, 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 that statement was not meant to address other types of updates you might or might not do. Okay, so that's the way that's the way I read that. Thank you. That's all. Thank you. Our next question is from Christine Tax. Your line is open. Hi. Yes, this is Christine from Work of Clinical Diagnostics. I have two parts, and I think one you probably already covered. Um, so my first question is. Um, in the details of where in the 510K submission should this cybersecurity reside. And then my second part of the question that I have is, since it's not been provided in our previous uh, 510K submissions, I would imagine we'd have to baseline when we would submit our next special 510K for our respective device. Is that correct? Uh, to, to your first point, this would be in your software risk analysis section. So the, the cybersecurity risk analysis would ask you to do would be called out specifically, but would be part of your software submission. Uh, in terms of your second question, could you repeat that? I'm not sure I fully grasped what you're asking. So since we've never provided this information before in our 510K submissions, um, if I have an update that would require a special 510K, we would actually have to essentially baseline all the requirements of this guidance at that point in time. Is that correct? We have to submit. So when we submit a special now, we submit based on any new information. So since we've never submitted this information before, we would have to submit it at that point in time, yes. even though the change isn't necessarily related to cybersecurity. Yes. Uh, at least the cybersecurity section of your risk analysis would have to be complete. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question is from Bob Caruso. Your line is open. Hi, this is Bob Caruso with Patel. Uh, will the FDA establish a baseline set of controls based on device type, or would the set of security controls be established by an initial risk analysis that incorporates both a threat assessment and a vulnerability assessment that's performed by the vendor? Uh, it would be by the vendor. The FDA would not be the one establishing the controls. 
uh, the FDA would like to just see justification for those controls and adequacy that they mitigate the risks in question. Would you foresee standard sets being developed over time for different classes of controls, say uh, pacemaker, insulin pump, et cetera, that are unique to those particular devices? Hello, this is Seth Carmody. Uh, I'm a subject matter expert at CDRH in the Office of the Future Diagnostics and Radiological Health. Um, and I'd like to answer your question. I think that uh, over time, uh, as we accumulate uh, experience with you know, the provided cybersecurity risk assessments, that there will be a, um, you know, a, a repertoire that we identify with and then look for another solution. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Our next question is from Dan Schmidt. Your line is open. Thank you. Um, so the FDA guidance emphasizes limiting user access and password strength requirements. If, if that responsibility is moved over to the health system through, as an example, Active Directory integration, is that considered a preferred solution? essentially moving that responsibility to the health system rather than building it into the medical device solution. Again, that is a recommendation. If there's alternative, including moving it as you suggested, that would mitigate the risk adequately. I think this would be one we'd consider. I would not want to be prescriptive now and say that was something that you should do. Uh, again, what we'd like to see is threats posed by simple password or e E easy authentication be limited. Okay, thank you. Our next question is from Tina O'Brien. Your line is open. Hi, um, I think you've answered this question previously, but I'm, since I'm in queue, I'll ask it anyhow. Um, if we have a device, a low-risk device from a cybersecurity perspective that we've categorically, uh, I guess, excluded, um, f from any any vulnerabilities in our software section is uh, you know a, a simple rationale with our our thought process uh, adequate or do we need to carry that through into our our risk management documentation to show that how we've considered it um, and what the risks are or what the risks are I suppose. We would like besides the rationale we would like to see at least. Uh, some uh, some kind of a matrix of each risk that you've considered uh, pointing to a mitigation so that we have a better understanding of all the different types of risks that have been considered and how they're being mitigated. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question is from Ray Riddle. Your line is open. For a network-controlled or connected medical device, when you're doing your assessment of the risk, how much can you rely on the network, the inherent network security itself? This is Seth Carmody again. Um, uh, I think it's important to remember that you know your medical devices, and uh, uh, to uh, take into account that your medical devices could be going into a hostile environment. Uh, you may have no control over the uh, network uh, security provided by the network in which they're established. So I think that it would behoove you to uh, adopt controls that defend your, your device singularly um, and, and as if they're in a, and going into a hostile environment. All right, thank you. Our next question is from Joe. Your line is open. Uh, yes, relative to the mitigations that are being put in place, uh, what considerations are you making around labeling changes versus actually design changes within a product to be able to mitigate some of the security vulnerabilities? I think where appropriate labeling could mitigate a vulnerability if it adequately conveys to the end user what, how to mitigate those risks. Okay, great. And uh, second follow-up question. Um, as I understood, this was applicable mostly to new products that are being submitted for 510Ks and considered for 510Ks, products that are in the market already um, that are potentially just getting updates. 
um, wouldn't be uh, subject to it um, unless they're being refiled for a, a new 510k submission. Is that correct? I'm not distinguishing just getting updates versus a new 510k submission. Uh, if you have a product that's on the market that requires a 510k because of changes you've made, it would be up to the discretion of the, re of the review branch to see whether cybersecurity risks need to be concerned or whether the device as it stands alone poses low risk and so those mod the modification you propose could go through without addressing cybersecurity. Okay, but just to clarify, you know, as as companies are making priorities on, you know, new product adoption versus adopting a, a legacy product that may have been in the field and close to an end of, of life, how is the FDA seeing the relative risks of those different and, and what standards or expectations are you putting in place for different device vendors? I'm not sure the agency is putting any expectations. We would like to see all vendors consider cybersecurity risks when they design and produce their device. The FDA recognizes that with legacy devices, uh, these modifications may not be practical or feasible, but we don't want to set expectations based on that. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Our next question is from Yvonne Newell. Your line is open. Oh, hi. Um, I have a question for the software package delivered through the website or cloud. Uh, how should we handle that through the um, cybersecurity issue? Could you repeat the question? Okay, like a software delivered through the website or through the cloud. How, when, how can we mitigate any like a risk analysis or that will be an uh, impact on the cyber security. If you're saying that you have a medical device that's a standalone software that's delivered through the clouds? Yeah, or like a service package, like a, uh, like a small release updating software. Both. So uh, if, the if you're... Standalone software or for the uh, software update through the website or through the cloud. Okay. If, you're, if you're providing patches through software updates and, or clouds, uh, the agency would like to see some kind of built-in authentication so that the device where the patch is being placed trusts the source from which the patch is coming. Uh, in terms of standalone software that might exist in the cloud or on the network someplace, uh, I think there's there needs to be an analysis of the environment in which that software exists and what risks might be present to it. Okay, so do you uh, just like a password to require will be good enough, or what else additional um, implementation uh, we should consider? Again, we don't want to be prescriptive. Uh, we would like you to choose a method and be able to justify why you feel that method is appropriate. Thank you. Next question to Crystal. Your line is open. Hi. Uh, what's, which um, devices are subject to the cybersecurity? Um, like I just, is it just soft? Is it mostly software? Or I know you said mentioned um, you have to maintain the device integrity. So I'm just not sure which devices would be would need to follow the cybersecurity. Software that I mean, medical devices that are vulnerable to cybersecurity risks will be subject to this. Uh, the section in, that dealt with integrity of the device, we were trying to specify from the time you, the device has been manufactured to the time it leaves your facility and goes to the vendor, to the vendor meaning the time that you have it, you should be able to assure have some documentation that assures that that, that that device's integrity has not been compromised. Would you be able to give an example of which devices would be subject to cybersecurity? Again, if the device is 
vulnerable to cybersecurity threats. So if it has some kind of computer logic that could be reprogrammed, if it has software running on it, if it's the software that's also a medical device, all those will be subject. Do you have an like, example? For instance, a CT scanner with uh, software that runs the different therapeutic modes, that would be a, a device that would be subject to this guidance. Um, if you have a blood pressure cuff that transmits its information to a mobile app, it would be subject to this guidance. I see. It, it, yes, that yeah, that doesn't answer my question. Thank you. Our next question is from Frank Sutkin. Your line is open. Hello. Yes. Uh, I, I hope this question will make sense to you. So uh, I'm looking here. What, what can we expect as the disposition of the FDA for submissions coming forward? Is there a leeway period? Uh, you know, we development finished six, seven, twenty years ago, something like that. We're just getting around to it. I mean, I don't, I'm not saying that's actually the case. I'm just giving an extreme. Can we expect a leeway disposition from the FDA moving forward for submissions? I think when you provide a submission, we would like to have a conversation with you about cybersecurity, whether it is appropriate to to provide a leeway or not. I think will be made by the reviewed branch. Okay. So your answer, if I may rephrase it and you can correct me, is a case by case basis we'll see moving forward, but it will but circumstances will be taken in, into consideration. Yes. Okay, thank you very much. The next question is from Philip Lee. Your line is open. Thank you. Philip Novalis Lee from Griffles Diagnostic Solutions. My question pertains to labeling or instructions for use. If there are any best practices that you could provide as far as the scope or what aspects of cybersecurity other than um, what was uh, mentioned, firewall or antivirus software that should be captured in our instructions for use. The second aspect of my question uh, pertains to the risk management guidance. Uh, can we use the standard uh, ISO 14971 in lieu of an IT network specific standard on uh, risk management? Uh, to your first question, I think I'm not sure if the agency could provide specific examples. It depends on the use environment of your device that you need to provide adequate labeling. If you have an idea of where your device might be used, for instance, if it's a home use device, you might want to provide labeling instructions to a home user as to what the minimum configuration should be to based on the security that you've implemented in your device. Uh, if your device is going into a hospital, clearly the labeling might be different. So it would really depend on the use environment of your device. And uh, I'll defer to one of my colleagues to answer your second question. And this is uh, Linda Ritchie. Um, I'm also from the Office of Device Evaluation. Can you repeat the second half of your question, please? Uh, basically, if we could adopt the uh, ISO 14971 risk management in lieu of using uh, an IT network specific standard on risk management? Uh, certainly the ISO 14971 standard is an FDA recognized standard for risk management um, and you are certainly welcome to use that uh, as part of your risk management process. It's also important to understand that the risks that um, you might be uh, trying to identify with regards to cybersecurity um, might also be well characterized by other 
uh, standards that deal more with IT security. And so if you wanted to use a combination of the two, that would certainly be um, an option that we would be open to. Thank you. Our next question is from Jordan. Your line is open. Hi, yes, uh, Jordan Lightcock here. Um, if we are submitting a 513G application for information and uh, from past applications, uh, we're seeking to be a non-medical device, but it is used in the medical field and passes similar type data, is there anything we need to elaborate more on cybersecurity than we have in the past? In a 513G? Yes. That's okay. A 513G would not be a submission where the agency would expect to see cybersecurity information. Okay, and uh, uh, would it be helpful in... I mean, a 513G is a request for information uh, about the classification of the device. It, it, it will not be a, a safety and effectiveness review assessment. So it, would not be, okay. it would not be necessary to do that there. Okay. All right. Thanks. Our next question is from Leonid. Your line is open. Uh, thank you. Hello. It's Leonid uh, Dario. Uh, I would like to ask uh, another question about updates to the software. <clears throat> I see two aspects of the, uh, of the update. Uh, one of the aspects you covered recently about the security of the update itself so that uh, we can mitigate the risks of uh, invalid update or um, failed update. However, another question I have is, uh, um, in case our update includes new features for the application or um, changes the behavior of our application, uh, who is, how should we decide if this is um, allowed by the FDA to be under the same submission of, of the whole application, or this update has to be separately um, submitted. Uh, what is the criteria here? If an update is changing the specification of how your device functions, whether then that would be a modification that would probably require a new submission. If your update is only patching a cybersecurity vulnerability and not affecting the specification for which your device has been cleared, then that would not require a pre-market submission. Uh, so only those, um, okay, when we uh, define the specification of how the device uh, is functioning, does it, does it include uh, a new feature our user might get with an update? which was not clearly defined when we did the submission. However, the, it, it just adds another ability for the user, for example, to review the data or to somehow work with the data that it gather, gathers with the device. Is, is there a possibility to add such feature without violating our previous submission? Um, so... Your question really is outside the scope of the cybersecurity guidance. I mean, the cybersecurity guidance is talking about updates that are specific to cybersecurity vulnerabilities that you're trying to patch. If you're asking a question about when to submit a new 510K for changes uh, that you're making to your device, whether it be software or otherwise, um, I uh, encourage you to check our website on uh, – uh, there's a document called When to Submit a New 510K that will cover the uh, when you change the functionality of your device, software, otherwise, what would require a new 510K. And if you right, have further questions regarding that, um, I would encourage you to contact the review division um, that handles your types of devices to have a more specific conversation. All right, thank you. I understand. Our next question is from Claudia Jackson. Your line is open. Yes, hi. Um, I have a question uh, surrounding the um, information on cybersecurity that you would submit to the FDA. For each submission that you do, you do a submission for changing your a significant change in your device. 
And because your device um, may have a legacy model or version, cybersecurity or the system of the cybersecurity around that device has already been established and risk has already been mitigated and discussed. But if I do a modification or I do a significant change to that device that has nothing to do with the cybersecurity of that device, my submission still has to include, this is the question, still has to include the risk analysis that was done maybe two or three models or versions ago. That's the question. I hope, I, I hope that was understandable. And if you feel that the risk analysis that was done two, three years ago adequately mitigates risks that are at present time, you could reference that risk analysis? Okay, but I would have to submit in that risk analysis in its entirety, um, um, which may be based upon different test cases and um, have a different traceability matrix. And this could get kind of, I could get kind of lost in, in what the FDA is looking for. Uh, yes, you present a very challenging situation in which you've actually done some um, work on cybersecurity for legacy devices that you uh, that was not presented previously to the FDA, and now your versions have moved onward. So the the rationale and the risk analysis um, for what you have done previously, even though it still applies, you can't map directly into your submission now. Is that a summary? Right. Thank you. <laughs> Um, certainly, certainly, we want to uh, uh, evaluate. You know, evaluate is kind of a strong word here, but we would want you. We want to have known that you evaluated the um, uh, cybersecurity risks for your device. So, in those cases, um, certainly, I would talk to the review division and make sure you have an open dialogue with them, explaining, um, you know, what you have done previously. But at least at a at a minimum, I think you could provide a summary of the risk um, mitigations that you put in place to address cybersecurity, reference where they were done in the life cycle of your device, um, and how they still apply. Okay, that's reasonable. Thank you. Our next question is from Pritpal Singh. Your line is open. Hi, my name is Paul from BioRadio Solution, Imikor. Um, my question is in regard to mitigate the risk arising from cyber attack. Um, is there a guidance or minimum standard that is recommended during the validation testing, or is there anything coming up? At this time, there is no guidance that the FDA is, has issued on that topic. Uh, the FDA has recognized a number of standards on this topic, uh, but also if you believe that you have adequately met a threshold and you could justify that threshold to us, that, that would be something we would consider. Thank you. Our next question is from Michael Seberger. Your line is open. I have a question regarding um, the deliverable where it talks about we need to have a, a company needs to have a summary for a uh, plan for providing validated software updates and patches. Since a lot of medical devices contain third-party software such as, say, device drivers or operating systems, are, are you expecting that the documentation should include uh, risks or vulnerabilities and mitigations slash controls for um, monitoring, say, um, operating system vulnerabilities that aren't directly responsible uh, of the manufacturer and to have a plan for controlling those or for uh, updating patches. And also, when you mentioned just a summary of a plan, I'm curious how much detail is the FDA expected in the submission or is uh, a summary of basically that the company will monitor, say, an OS vendor's uh, security patches and you know, make appropriate plans when a critical issue comes up to field a patch. Is that a summary enough or is that more details expected? We would like to know that what, how you are approaching that issue to some detail. We don't want we don't want exact timelines of who and how often. But if you have a third party software, uh, how you are approaching cybersecurity? Are you locking it down so no updates are possible? Are you providing 
your customer with means? Are you expecting your customers to be the ones that are doing that? We would like to have, like to have some idea of how you're approaching this issue. Okay, that makes sense. Thanks. Dina Castro, your line is open. Hi, my name is Dina Castro from Beckman Culture in Miami. I have two questions. One is, uh, the first one is, uh, is the instrument manufacturer responsible for the cybersecurity risk induced to the medical instrument by the hospital network? And if you have any recommendation or guidance. And the second question is, how do you recommend to handle the probability of occurrence of a cybersecurity risk when it is part of a system and we need to estimate the probability of the hazardous situation? Thank you. This is Seth Carmody again. Uh, could you repeat the second part of your question, please? Second part. The second question is, how do you recommend to handle the probability of occurrence of a cybersecurity risk. When that risk is part of a system and we need to estimate the system probability of the hazardous situation, that can be either a run of results reporting to the physician or a delay of results reported to the physician. It's, it's going to depend. Uh, and you, you uh, device manufacturers, will be the experts in how their uh, device uh, uh, acts. Um, and, I mean, you need to be controlling for uh, uh, risks that are sort of, um, they come along with being in a net, as a network system. Um, it should assess risk, uh, just like you assess risk, um, uh, due to whatever test systems are on your analyzer um, in controlling for um, either delayed results or erroneous results uh, due to a hack. So yes, you should uh, you should not rely on uh, the network. These are, uh, systems are going into hostile environments, um, and you already are experts in assessing risk uh, of that test system. Um, when what would happen if you have a delay in result or erroneous result, whether it's to uh, an aspiration or, or a sample volume issue, or somebody intentionally trying to uh, to um, uh, cause harm. Our next question is from Matt Shaw. Your line is open. Yes. Um, my question just revolves around how will the uh, enforcement be for this? I mean, as in, I know that there will be questions asked during the 510K um, submission process and just the clearance of it, but also will this now become part of the standard QCIT uh, inspection? I'm just curious what the enforcement for this will look like. Again, this is a pre-market guidance. It does not deal with post-market or enforcement issues. Okay. Okay. All right, great. Thanks. Appreciate it. Thank you. Next question from Lori Trotter. Your line is open. Yeah, hi. I had a question regarding the scope and the inclusion of programmable logic. Um, can you provide some guidance around that, um, including what your definition of programmable logic is? Um. I, I would I would interpret uh, programmable logic as a uh, hardware that can uh, functionality that can be re reprogrammed, and um, you know the uh, there are plenty of resources uh, that that currently exist uh, in other sectors uh, that you can look to uh, in terms of guidance. The FDA has no uh, specific guidance on uh, those technical items, um, but I, I'll point you to the. Uh, uh, government agencies such as NIST or other sectors such as banking or industrial control systems or defense sectors. Okay, thank you very much. Next question.
Operator? I'm sorry, are you able to hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Diane, your line is open. All right, we're going to move on. John with Zima Medical, your line is open. Hi, I have a question about the encryption, encryption of data communication between medical devices and some external devices. Since since the manufacturer is not, a, is not required to follow any kind of industry standards and we can choose whatever scheme, that we, encryption scheme that we think is suitable, is there a, a, a basic minimum requirement about the strength of encryption that is, that is needed, like from a mathematical standpoint? I mean, does it, from a mathematical analysis standpoint, I mean, is there any minimum requirement that it has to meet? Uh, be able to prove that this en encryption scheme is strong enough to withstand hack Hacker attacks. I think the agency's perspective is for you to provide a rationale for whatever scheme that you've chosen and whatever strength it is that it is adequate to mitigate the risk your device faces in the use environment. So the agency will not is not going to be prescriptive on that. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Our next question is from Deborah. Your line is open. Hello. Um, I have two questions. Uh, the first is um, for submissions that are currently under review, is this something that you anticipate that it would be brought up during, um, you know, the review process if, if we've already received from the, our first response from the FDA? If the submission was submitted on October 1st or later, depending on your device type, you may or may not. Okay. And then the other question is, um, under the guidance, there's a section that goes into the different means to limit access to trusted users only. Um, would, would it be possible to, for example, the first bullet says, limit access to devices through the authentication of users? For example, user ID and password, smart card, biometric. Would you be able to provide an example where that would be most appropriate? It's difficult to provide an example of, it would depend on what your device is and the use environment. There might be use environments where providing such means of authentication would not be practical. For instance, if your device was being used in a surgical suite, that would probably not be an appropriate method of authentication. In other use environments, it might. Uh, what the agency would like to see is for you to consider different methods and choose the one most appropriate for your use environment that reduces the risk of unauthorized access. Yeah, this may be something that we may put in as a comment, a general comment um, to the guidance. Uh, it would it would be helpful if there were examples. I mean, obviously we don't expect the FDA to give us a recipe book, um, you know, we should be able to, but if, if we could gauge better where the FDA's position is and maybe some, cite some examples, that would be, that would be helpful. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question is from Debbie Brown. Your line is open. Hi, this is Debbie Brown. I'm, uh, there was a question somewhat like this earlier, but I think this is slightly different. Are the cybersecurity guidelines applicable to mobile apps that are subject to enforcement discretion? Mobile apps that are subject to enforcement discretion are exempt from the FDNC Act, so we will not see, there will be no submission required, so there will be no submission that the FDA would be reviewing. At the same time, just as a general practice, we would encourage you to consider cybersecurity as part of your risk assessment, regardless of whether you know, the FDA will see that submission or not. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question is from Sanjay. Your line is open. Yes, Jen. Um, thank you for the platform. We just have a question in terms of uh, the cybersecurity, how how much it extends uh, with regards to the cybersecurity 
within the medical device application or also to the interfaces to the third party tools that that our device that our device would interface on and and also with you know like do we have to have requirements for the third party tools for the uh, for the cybersecurity I hate to ask a question. The question in your submission: Are you describing the risks associated with third-party tools also, or is your submission going to be limited to your device? We I, would have the third-party tools. Um, we would have the risk identified for those tools as well. But then, you know, obviously, we don't develop those tools, so we don't have a handle in terms of how they manage their their cybersecurity environment. While they, while yes. So you, while you don't have a handle on how they manage their cybersecurity scope environment, it would be useful to know that you have considered what risks might be posed to your device from being in that environment and try to address any risk that might be present because of that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Our next question is from Edward. Your line is open. Hi, yeah, this is Ashcon Rasuli from Edwards Life Science. I've actually got three questions I want to ask too, though, in the interest of time. Uh, first one is uh, for some of the software, including firmware and embedded software, the um, cybersecurity mitigations for the risk management are uh, inherent to the fact that the software is isolated and it will not be accessed from outside and there will be no ways of communicating with the software. There are no particular software mitigations built into the software necessarily. I'm interested to know if with this new guidance, FDA is specifically looking for further software mitigations for cybersecurity or not. Uh, so I guess I'll do them one at a time. Uh, that was my first question. So uh, just for clarification, you're referring to a, a device which would require physical access? Correct. So let's say you've got an isolated chip inside of a device, which, you know, in order for corruption of the software, one would need to crack open the device and access the chip. Uh, well, I mean, I guess there's still a risk that it's, it's, and you've identified it there, that somebody would have to do that. So, I mean, discussing that, what the, the risk is associated with it is, and if that's an acceptable risk level, um, please, you know, indicate that, and then, therefore, you wouldn't have to control for it. Okay. Um, my second question is around, uh, on the slide, you did mention uh, protecting critical functions when cybersecurity is compromised. Uh, there were examples of drivers. Um, do we have a better idea of what those critical functions are, or is that something that basically we define at the design level? Are you expecting that to be documented um, specifically, or does that just go along with other um, critical to safety requirements? Um, I'm just a little not sure on what that definition entails. So again, I think that will depend on your device, but. The rash, at least the thinking by the agency there is if there are functions that your device has that's life sustaining, it would be important to try to make sure that those functionalities are maintained regardless of failures in other components of your device. Okay, do you see this playing with, uh, um, with uh, the safety cl classification of the device or no? Um, interacting in a way? Well, I guess. Uh, I, I, no. So we're not saying if you are this class or this class, you have to approach this. I think our, our recommendation is that for your device, you look at all the risks involved and if there are risks that are so high that there should be some kind of mitigation put in place to prevent it from failing when other parts fail, that you consider that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Our next question is from Emmett. Your line is open. Hello, uh, this is Mamet Tomash. Uh, I had a question related to this uh, submission. Uh, in the submission, do you expect to uh, get the details of the residual vulnerabilities? And if you expect to ha uh, receive them, to what detail do you expect them? 
You mean res residual risk after you've mitigated for the device? Uh, well, residual vulnerabilities, uh, the technical details of those risks. Do I you think expect to receive them? I think a, a, a general overview of what those are would be adequate. I don't think we need a tech in depth technical detail. Excellent. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you. Our next question is from Ian Nimarov. Your line is open. Hi. With the uh, interest in cybersecurity, has, this, has the FDA changed the way it's looking at open source software that's built into products? No, the agency has not changed how it, it reviews software in general, open source or otherwise. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question is from Mike Menzinger. Your line is open. Hello. Uh, my question relates to validation of security patches. Uh, so you mentioned that upon uh, patching a system, um, you expect a plan to include validation of the functionality still works properly. Um, so my question relates to some new platforms that are uh, coming out on the cloud where platform updates are not under the control of the device vendor, that the updates are automatically rolled out. Um, in this particular instance, have, do you have any guidance on um, how, the, how a medical device vendor should deal with that? Uh, not in this instance. I'll just say that will not be just a cybersecurity issue. That will be a larger software update issue. Okay. So the, um, is the there uh, – if, if we can uh, – if, if we had a plan where we could detect uh, that the, the update is being rolled out and uh, do a validation at that event, is that something that you've considered acceptable in the past? Well, um, so let's say you have something on the Android platform and Android platforms are being continuously being updated. The assumption is that you, before providing a patch to, a, to your de medical device that's on there, you'd have made sure that it will work with whatever new version may be coming or is, has been implemented since your last update. I'm not sure if that answers your question directly. Sure, that makes sense. So if there's a breaking change from a platform, um, as long as the, the device vendor provides a change that the user can install uh, to make it compatible, that would be acceptable. Yes, but again, I think that becomes a, a larger issue than just cybersecurity. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Our next question is from Jason Yom. Your line is open. Hi, uh, Jason Yom from uh, Backpack Culture Chatsworth. Uh, the question is regarding the firmware, custom firmware that was developed in-house. Does the risk analysis that's getting filed as part of the 510K should include the uh, risk analysis of, for the firmware, cybersecurity um, risks? We already planned for the OS and uh, the workstation software, but uh, I don't think we have any plan for the firmware part. Uh, this is Seth Carmen again. Um, I, I think that you should consider uh, cybersecurity risks uh, in, with regards to your firmware. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question is from Dan Schmidt. Your line is open. Dan, you may have your phone on mute. All right. We're going to move to the next question. Elizabeth George, your line is open. Uh, yes, this is Elizabeth George with Philips Healthcare. Um, the question I have is, is the number of times you've mentioned uh, reliance on the reviewers during the 510K process I know the reviewers uh, have a standard training program. I'm just curious as to where they stand in being trained in understanding what a cybersecurity risk is, what vulnerabilities are, and even what some of the nomenclature that the vendors will be submitting in the uh, submissions. We continue to provide reviewers training, and we also continue to have uh, subject matter experts ready for those reviewers to rely on when the submission comes, if there's something there that they are unfamiliar with. Thank you. Appreciate that. 
Thank you. Our next question is from Gretel. Your line is open. Hello, this is Gretel. I'm from Phillips Healthcare also. Um, my question had to do around with the how does the agency going to address refusal to accept policy in light of this new guidance? And, um, and you know, there's just been a lot of uh, recommendations, you know, talk, uh, make determinations with the reviewers uh, as to whether or not we need to include the security. And what my concern is that with the refusal to accept policy that we could get the submission kicked out even though we have agreement with the agency already to not include security for whatever reason. The refuse to accept will not apply here, so your submission would not be kicked out because of this. Okay. I just wanted to clarify that because I, you, we hear a lot about that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Our next question is from Stephen Garski. Your line is open. Hi. Um, one of the things that happens when driving down residual risks of cybersecurity is it becomes evident that the residual risks lie in the hands of the responsible organization. And, uh, you know, there's a balance between usability and, and authentication, as you know. Um, some of those hazards just don't go away as a result of, um, or they can only be driven to a certain level because of res reliance on the responsible organization to do their job as prescribed in the labeling for the use of that particular device. What's the agency's thinking on what the appropriate handoff is for the responsible organization? Because uh, you can only mitigate so far in some cases. Thank you. Uh, and the agency recognizes that. So one of the ways to ensure appropriate handoff is to provide it in your labeling as to what your device is, is capable or what risks your device is mitigating against and what your expectation is in the use environment. And the FDA would like to see better communication between, the, I guess, vendors and end users about how to manage risks as a whole. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question is from Gary with Welch Allen. Your line is open. Hi, this is Gary with Welch Allen. We had a recent submission, and the FDA came back with requesting cybersecurity requirements. In terms of upfront requirements, how, how those define and what, what are you actually looking for in terms of actual cybersecurity requirements? I'm not sure I could speak to specific submissions. I would say that you sh the agency may ask you questions regarding as to how you've mitigated risks that are associated with your device, and the expectation is that you could provide information and justification for approaches that you've taken. But I would further encourage you to talk to either the reviewer or the branch chief in the branch that your device is being reviewed. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question is from Chilpi. Your line is open. Hi. Um, I'm Chilpi from Striker. I would li like to ask if my device has Wi-Fi capabilities, but it is not in the public network. Does it still require cybersecurity? If your device is vulnerable because it's connecting to a network by which it can be compromised, then that's the risk that you, we would like you to consider and provide just provide information to us of how you consider that risk and mitigate it against it. Thank you. And I have just one more question. Do mobile apps require 510K? It depends whether the mobile app that you are referring to is a medical device that is being regulated or is a medical device that has been put under enforcement discretion by guidance. So it, it depends on. Perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you. Our next question is from Claudia Jackson. Your line is open. Yes, I have a question about um, the healthcare IT framework because of the medical device manufacturer that I work for, we fall under um, uh, ONC regulations and HHS regulations and CMS regulations as well as FDA regulations. 
And so some of the cybersecurity measures that we have taken, um, we've taken for other agencies' regulations. Um, and with the FDA's um, guidance, is it going to remain in line with what was proposed as the health IT framework of all of these organizations? And just remain risk-based. That's, that's my question. Yeah, I appreciate your question. Unfortunately, I mean, I came prepared in terms of talking about this guidance and the policy implications. And that's that's a larger question. question that I'm not able to answer. Oh. Is there anyone on the panel that would be able to answer that question? Uh, it's about the guidance. Is the guidance going to remain within that health IT framework? The guidance will be applicable to submissions, whether it's in the larger framework or not, if you're submitting to the FDA for a pre-market clearance, the guidance will apply. How that, how the agency's guidance, I think, interplay with ONC or what other federal agencies may require, I don't think here at the table we are prepared to answer that question. Okay. Uh, I, I'm trying Even to though think. the FDA is heading up the health IT framework? Uh, the, uh, I, I would suggest contacting the health, the contact person for the health IT framework and maybe directing that question there. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question is from Frank Sutkin. Your line is open. Hello again. Yeah, nice to talk to you. So uh, you, the, a while back now, you answered a question saying, where does the documentation go, the documentation that you asked for in the guidance document? And you pointed to the risk analysis in the software. And I don't disagree with you, but I'd like you to uh, elaborate on your point because your general principles of software validation, final guidance for industry and FDA staff, talks to security measures as going into the software design specification and not the risk analysis. So could you elaborate and say where you expect our documentation to be present in our submission? Does that question make sense? Sorry, I was having trouble with the microphone. Uh, this is Linda Ritchie again. Um, certainly there are many different uh, sections of the software documentation in a submission uh, that could characterize the risks and mitigations posed by uh, cybersecurity as well as, as other things. We had pointed to the risk analysis in this discussion for the cybersecurity uh, more as a starting point. Um, certainly anything that uh, is in your risk analysis that uh, then points to a mitigation we would look for in other places as that is common in um, uh, addressing risks. Uh, so it's, I don't think it's inconsistent when we were discussing with regards to this guidance that we expect you to start with the risk mitigation because as has been stated previously, we expect this to be done, to be done um, in a risk approach. Uh, certainly there will be other aspects of your design and implementation that may contain information related to the mitigations for your cybersecurity, as with many other functions in your device. I hope that answers your question. Yes, ma'am. If I may rephrase your answer just for clarity, the you expect that risks go with risks, uh, that requirements go with requirements, and bugs go with bugs in our submissions. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, and our final question is from Prabhu. Your line is open. Hi. Um, the, one of the differences between the draft guidance and the final guidance is the uh, mention of the core functions of IPDRR, the identify, protect, uh, detect, um, recover, respond, and recover. Um, do you, is there any expectation on the the uh, representation of IPDRR in the risk assessment itself for cybersecurity. Uh, any expectations on how it is mentioned or handled uh, so it's clear on how we're framing the risk assessment? 
I think that was meant to provide a general recommendation of approach. I think your uh, submission should follow the general format of software submissions where you generally identify, the, as previously discussed, the risks uh, accordingly, the designs accordingly, and so on. Okay, so you're viewing it as a uh, more of a process framework uh, to consider along the uh, risk management cycle as we evaluate cybersecurity. But if we focus on, say, um, confidentiality and um, um, the clinical security of the device, that should that's really what you're looking for. I would say that's correct. Okay, thank you. All right, there are no other <clears throat> no other questions in the queue at this time. Thank you. This is Irene. I hear. We appreciate your participation and thoughtful questions. Today's presentation, along with the slide presentation and transcript, will be available at www.fda.gov forward slash CDRH webinar by Friday, November 7th, under the tab Past Webinars and Stakeholder Calls 2014. If you have additional questions about this guidance, please use the contact information provided at the end of the slide presentation. As always, we appreciate your feedback. Again, thank you for your participation, and this concludes today's webinar. Thank you. This concludes today's conference. Participants, you may disconnect at this time.